so we're going to get started. Uh, no quiz today because we are pressed for time. We have the Brothers Game Night that will be after Isha. So we're going to start uh, straight away to the 55th uh, branch of Iman. The 55th branch of Iman. Birrul Walidayn. Kindness to parents. Kindness to parents. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَبِلْ وَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا uh, and he says, وَصَّيْنَ الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ إِحْسَانًا Several verses uh, that talk about the importance of kindness and good treatment to parents. And good treatment to parents is often uh, paired with worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran, وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّاهِ Right after that, وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا And your Lord has decreed that you worship none but Him uh, and to parents good treatment. And this is about three or four verses in the Quran like this. So there are several verses in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pairs his worship and his being deserve, deserving of worship. And right after that mentions kindness and obedience to parents. And this kindness, of course, is not just with uh, parents who are Muslim. It even extends to non-Muslim parents. It even extends to non-Muslim parents and even extends to non-Muslim parents who are uh, antagonistic towards Islam. As Allah says in the Quran, وَإِن جَهَدَاكَ عَلَىٰ أَن تُشْرِكَ بِي مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٌ فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا وَصَاحِبُهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْهُوفًا Allah says about those parents, those disbelieving parents, who they are trying to get you to commit shirk. They're trying to get you to do the worst thing possible. Allah says don't obey them. All right, don't obey them in that. But, وَصَاحِبُهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْهُوفًا But, maintain good company with them. So this kindness to parents and good treatment of parents extends uh, all the way to even the non-Muslim hostile parents, antagonistic parents, those who are opposed to Allah and His Messenger. And we still have to give good treatment to them. So imagine the Muslim righteous parents uh, and what uh, the emphasis on that. And we have the verse, the well-known verse in the Quran where Allah says, وَقَضَى رَبُكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُ إِلَّا إِيَّا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا إِمَّا يَبْلُغَنَّ عِنْدَكَ الْكِبْرَ أَحَدُهُمَا أَوْ كِلَاهُمَا فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفْ وَلَا تَنْهَرُهُمَا وَقُلْ لَهُمَا قَوْلًا كَرِيمًا And your Lord has decreed that you do not worship except Him and to parents good treatment. When one of them or both of them reach old age with you, say not to them as much. Uf, uf is the least, uh, the lowest level of disrespect. The, the lowest level of disrespect is to say uf. All right, so you, you, we don't take this verse to mean that you, you don't say uff, but you can do anything else. Right? Some people might understand. Uh, the verse says, don't say uff to them, but that means that we can yell at them or scream at them or hit, hit them and beat them. No. Uff is the lowest level of disrespect and uh, unkind treatment. So everything else after that enters into this prohibition. If you cannot even say uff to your parents, then this will include everything else that is greater than that, because this is the least level of disobedience and, dis, uh, and disrespect to the parents by saying uh, and the verse mentions when they reach old age this is not a condition this is not a condition right so if, if you're reading this verse a person might get the impression that uh, you, this, this verse or these rulings apply when they reach old age no this is in general in general whether they are young or old but when they reach old age it's even more emphasized even more emphasized to treat them with respect and be kind to them and not uh, show any level of disrespect. Uh, but it uh, doesn't mean that only when they get old do these rules apply. Uh, the scholars have mentioned as well that the parents, and included in this are the grandparents as well. All of the usul of a person, parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, they all are included in this, these commandments of doing good to the parents. Being kind to the parents is include the grandparents. We have some Grandparents here, right? Uh, so this also includes you guys, right? The grandparents, the great grandparents, and anybody else who is uh, in the, uh, the usul of that person. Uh, and then the verse continues, <clears throat> making dua for the parents. Uh, and Lord to them, the wing of humility, out of mercy, and say, My Lord, have mercy upon them as they brought me up when I was small. Uh, it is narrated in the Sahihain Bukhari Muslim by Ibn Mas'ud that he asked the Prophet ﷺ, which action does Allah love the most? And Rasulullah responded, Salah at its time, its correct time. 
And then he asked, what is next? I asked, he, and he said, kindness to parents, second thing mentioned. And what next? I inquired and he said, jihad in the path of Allah. And we've seen these questions before, right? they've come, and the order is different, or the answers are different. And we mentioned before that sometimes Rasulullah SAW would answer in a way that is uh, befitting to the questioner. So it doesn't necessarily mean that these things are in that specific order, um, that uh, this order is firm. It just sometimes it could either mean that these are amongst the best things, or it could mean that Rasulullah was answering that questioner according to what is better for him. So for this person, salah for you. Make sure you pray on time. Maybe he was a person who was uh, not praying on time in the salah, and then he mentions kindness of parents, and then jihad in the path of Allah. Uh, from amongst the uh, things that in, are included in uh, kindness to parents and good treatment of parents, it's also good treatment of the friends of the parents, the friends of the mother, the friends of the father, and so on. And there is a, a beautiful story of Ibn, Ibn Umar radiallahu an, where Ibn Umar he used to ride around town with, with, with a donkey, and he used to wear a turban, and he used to be noticeable, right? be very noticed. So he was riding around town, and he came across a, Bedou a Bedouin, an Arabi Bedouin. And by all accounts, this was a, a, a normal, uh, Arab Bedouin with no significance, right? And Ibn Umar, he got down from his donkey, he took off his turban, and he gave it to that Arabi, that Bedouin, and he put him to ride on the, the donkey. So he gave him a lot of honor. He showed him a lot of respect and a lot of honor. So the companions of Ibn Mas'ud, they were confused, right? They were saying, they, they wanted to know why is Ibn Umar showing such level of respect and honor to uh, this. Uh, individual, who, when he's just a you know uh, a normal uh, uh, desert Arab uh, Bedouin, and then Ibn Umar responded. He said that, "Inna min abarul bir silatu rajuli ahla wudi abihi." That from the greatest means of uh, showing good treatment to parents and kindness to parents and birul walidain is to uh, be on good terms and show respect and honor to the loved ones of a person's parents. And then he said that this man was a friend of Umar. This man was a friend of Umar. And because of this friendship with Umar, Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu honored him because he was Umar's friend. So if we have, we know that our, our parents have certain friends, then it's also part of good treatment to the parents to also honor the, the friends of your parents, the friends of your father, the friends of your mother, stay in contact with them even after they pass away, stay in contact. Uh, with their friends and their and those who they had uh, good relations with. All right, moving on to the Asadis wal Khamsun in Shu'ab al Iman, Sulatul Arham. And this is very related to the previous one as well. This is a little bit broader now. So, kindness to parents and then expanding the circle uh, to include relatives. Include the relatives, Sulatul Arham, the uh, maintaining the ties and kinship. <clears throat> and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has some very severe warnings about. Uh, those who break the ties of kinship. Allah says in the Quran, so would you perhaps, if you turn away, cause corruption on earth and severe your ties of, of relationship, those are the ones who, uh, that Allah has cursed, so he deafened them and blind their vision. So Allah pairs those who cause corruption on the earth with those who uh, break off the ties of kinship, the ties of family relationship. So this is a very uh, severe warning. And another verse, Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ يَنْقُضُونَ عَهْدَ اللَّهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مِثَاقِهِ وَيَقْطَعُونَ مَا أَمَرَ اللَّهُ بِهِ أَنْ يُصَلَى وَيُفْسِدُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ أُولَئِكَ لَهُمُ اللَّعْنَ وَلَهُمْ سُؤُدَّى And those who break the covenant of Allah after contracting it and severe that which Allah has ordered to be joined, meaning the ties of kinship. They break what Allah has ordered for it to be joined, the ties of kinship. And cause corruption on earth. Once again, pairing corruption on earth with breaking the ties of kinship. It is those who are the losers. It is those who are the losers. Um, so this is also some... Yeah. Right. Um, so the question is, the Quran doesn't explicitly say that you have to obey your parents. Right. Um, so, what is the response to those people who say the Quran doesn't say you have to? Uh, you, that the Quran does not explicitly say you have to obey your parents. <clears throat> well, 
It might not explicitly say that, but uh, it is definitely implied in the verses, right? If, if you can't even say oof to them, all right, disobeying them would fall under even uh, by greater analogy, right? By greater analogy, if you can't even say oof to your parents, then disobeying them, that is an even higher level of disrespect, all right? Uh, assuming that, of course, they are uh, commanding you to do something that is permissible, all right? Uh, obviously, if they're commanding you to do something that is impermissible, then this does not uh, fall under obedience of the parents. But if they're commanding you to do something permissible, and even more so, something that is good and obligatory on you, then this would fall under, um, if you disobey them, this would fall under not, uh, the, the command of not saying oof to them, which would be anything, any level of disrespect. And disobedience, of course, is the highest level of disrespect. All, all this is the meaning of dutiful. وَبِلْ وَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا It's used in the hadith. It's used in the hadith. بِرْ right? بِرْ وَالِدَيْنِ But I don't, um, that word بِرْ is not, I don't think it's used in the Quran, but uh, it's used in the hadith. Uh, kinship um, is anyone who shares ancestry with you, anyone who shares common ancestry, blood relationship. So uh, that would include your blood relatives. And of course it would expand to the closer the blood relative is, the more emphasized that relationship is. Um, as far as you're saying the wife, it won't, it won't be the same level, right? It won't be at the same level, but of course you would uh, encourage your wife to maintain her ties of kinship as well, all right? But it's, uh, it wouldn't be this ne necessarily the same. Yeah. Is there like a bare minimum when it comes Yes, so the bare minimum, right? The bare minimum of uh, Silat al-Arham is to avoid boycotting. Avoid boycotting, avoid cutting off and not talking to each other, all right? That's the bare minimum. All right, after that you have um, exchanging conversations, Invitation to houses, uh, exchanging gifts, right? And you get higher and higher and higher. All right, but the bare minimum is that you don't cut them off by not speaking to them and, and boycotting them. All right, that's the that's the bare minimum. Right. Right. Of course. Yeah. Of course, it would depend on the situation. All right. Uh, even back in the day, if a person uh, was living in a different country, then. Uh, you, you, you're not uh, expected to go and travel to that country, right? If, if especially if it was far away, just to maintain the ties of kinship, right? Ma uh, maintaining the ties of kinship means not breaking it off, not breaking it off. And uh, the, the, the origin is that, the, the asal is that, you're, you know, your family, that you're together, right? Until you break that off, then, then you have cut it off, right? But um, Boycotting doesn't mean that you didn't get a chance to speak to them. That's not the same as boycotting, right? You might not get a chance to speak to them. That's not the same as I'm actively not trying to speak to them. And if I see them, I'm avoiding them, right? There's a difference between the two. All right, so you're, you're required to do whatever is in your capability. You're not necessarily, you don't have to necessarily travel to them and reach out to them. But when you see them, then you, you know, maintain that uh, speaking terms, right? You maintain speaking terms. Um, yeah, what is, what is meant by the basic, what is meant by Surah Al-Aham, right? the family relationship? It, it, it starts with those who are uh, the closest to you, and it expands like that. Uh, it, it, can, it can continue to expand because we are all related in some way or the other, right? You'll find that you're all related, but um, the closer they are, the closer a person is, the more rights they have, and the more emphasized that relationship is. But it generally includes the people who are uh, immediate blood relatives, right? The immediate blood relatives, those who inherit from you, all right? And those who uh, are, you're not, you're not allowed to marry and so on. The, the aunts, the uncles, and cousins, and so on. All right? <clears throat> all right, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a number of verses uh, gives the stern and severe warning to those who uh, cut off the uh, ties of kinship. Uh, when I was in um, Morocco over like 10 years ago, all right, 10 years ago, uh, we prayed Salatul Jum'ah, and then we went to a, uh, we visited one of the sheikh's, one of the sheikh's houses, right? one of the local shiuk, we, we visited his house, 
And it so happened that there was a, a feast that was going on that day, right, a big feast. And uh, the reason for this feast is that there were two brothers, right, two brothers, and they had not spoken to each other. And they were old. They had gray hair, and they were very old at this point. And they hadn't spoken to each other for years. They had broken off relationship for years. And they finally made up with each other. And they finally had, uh, you know, got back on speaking terms and friendly terms. And so they threw a, a feast, and they had food together. And we, alhamdulillah, we participated in that. So that was a very happy occasion. When you, can, when you, when you mend back relationships, this is something good to do, right? To, um, it's a joyous occasion. So this is something that is encouraged. All right, uh, the, the, uh, another hadith, Anas ibn Malik reports that the Prophet ﷺ says, whoever would like his sustenance uh, to be uh, increased and to be blessed in his lifespan should maintain good ties with his relatives. All right, this is a means of having your risk increased. If you would like to have you, uh, your risk, your, uh, your, uh, uh, your wealth increased, this is one of the means of increasing your wealth by maintaining ties of kinship. And the hadith also mentioned to be blessed in lifespan. This is, this is a translation, this is interpretation of the, of the words. The hadith mentions, uh, which can translate to mean for a person's lifespan to be extended. The hadith actually mentions lifespan to be extended. Uh, if you want your lifespan to be extended, then maintain the ties of kinship. The scholars have discussed what does this mean. So uh, the way the translator uh, translated it, he translated it to mean to be, uh, to be blessed in his lifespan. This is one interpretation that uh, when Rasulullah means says that you will be exp ex ex expanded in your lifespan, meaning your life will be more blessed. You will have more barakah in your life. And some other scholars take it literally. They say that, no, you actually, if you maintain the ties of kinship, you will live even longer. You will live even longer. So the question comes up, though, is that we know that everything is already decreed, right? Everything is already decreed. How is it then that a person's life can even increase more when it's already been decreed already? And uh, the scholars have mentioned that when it comes to the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right, the, the divine decree and predestination, that there is the qadr that is set and firm. Right? This does not change at all. And this is what is written in the preserved tablet, the lawh al-mahfuz. Right? This does not change at all. And then there is another type of qadr, which they call al-qadr al-mu'allaq, which is conditional. Certain things you do can change that qadr. And this is the qadr that is written in the, uh, a person's book when they are, uh, when the soul is, is first blown into the, uh, into the, the fetus. Right? Uh, the hadith mentions that uh, when, the, when, the, um, when 40 days has, has passed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends an angel. And this angel writes, has a book that he writes down. He writes down four things. Uh, uh, that he, re he writes down this person's provisions for his entire life and he writes down this person's uh, lifespan, how long they will live and he writes down this person's deeds and whether they will be wretched or happy these four things are written down so this book, it can be changed all right? it can be changed uh, by things like maintaining the ties of kinship or it can be changed by things like dua dua can change this book Right, and then there's also a, like a, so there's a, a book that is written at the beginning of a person's life when 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 the angel first blows that uh, the soul into the body, and then there's a yearly book right uh, where the yearly uh, destiny is written for the the next year. This can also be changed depending on certain actions like maintaining ties of kinship, dua, and so on. Right. So we have the qadr when we talk about qadr and what, what can be changed and what cannot be changed. The qadr that is in the preserved tablet, Allah al-Mahfu, that cannot be changed. That is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the before, before creation. But then you have uh, other books, which uh, the, the, the book that is written at the time a person, the soul is blown into, and the book that is uh, written that will happen, things that will happen in the next year, this, is, this can be changed depending on a person's actions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, those are lower books, yes. Right, they are still subject, those, those two lower books are still subject to the, the, the master book. That, the master book cannot be changed, right? because that is Allah's permanent knowledge of everything that will happen. Right? And wh whatever Allah wills, that, that's going to happen. But these other books, lower books, right, they, they contain uh, the, what we call Qadr al-Mu'allaq, which is a Qadr that is suspended. It can be, it can be subject to change.
Allah uh, So whoever would like his sustenance to be increased and to be blessed in his lifespan, as we mentioned, this could either mean you have more barakah in your life if you maintain the ties of kinship, or it could mean you actually live longer, longer than you should have, based on that uh, secondary meaning of qadr, the one that, can, that is subject to change. Uh, this person should maintain good ties uh, with his relatives. Uh, then we have the hadith uh, that the Prophet said, no one cuts his family ties, who cuts his family ties shall enter Jannah. لا يدخل الجنة قاطر Right, whoever cuts off family ties, they will not enter Jannah. Uh, what does this mean? We've already been, uh, we've explained before that the only unforgivable sin is shirk. In Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bihi wa yaghfiru ma duna dhalik liman yasha. Alright, Allah will does, will does not forgive that partners be set up with him, but he forgives everything else after that. So any other sin can be forgiven. But yet here we have a hadith like this which say that a person cuts off the, tie, the family ties, they will not enter Jannah. So what does that mean? Does that mean that they will not enter Jannah at all? What do you guys say? Anybody have an answer? Huh? Yeah. Okay. 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 So, but will they enter Jannah? The hadith says they will not enter Jannah. So how do we reconcile? The hadith is saying they will not enter Jannah. And then we are saying that they will still enter Jannah. Anybody else? Okay. Okay, good. Yeah, essentially, that's what we're saying, that they will not enter Jannah. The meaning is they will not enter Jannah at the beginning with the first batch. Right? They will not enter Jannah with the first batch. It doesn't mean that they will not enter Jannah at all. They will enter Jannah in, uh, as long as they have Tawheed, but they will not enter with the first batch. All right, so whoever cuts off family ties shall not enter at the beginning. Yes. All right, so we explained this before. What do you mean by cutting family ties? Meaning avoiding boycotting them, not boycotting them. Maintaining cordial relationship with family. And there's another hadith where the Rasulullah says, لَيْسَ الْوَاصِلُ بِالْمُكَافِئِ وَلَكِنَّ الْوَاصِلَ الَّذِي إِذَا انْقَطَعَتُ رَحِمُهُ وَصَلَهَا That uh, the, the maintaining the ties of kinship is not that you, you know, exchange pleasantries and you exchange gifts and these kind of things. But maintaining the ties is that when it's cut off, when somebody cuts you off, you try to connect it once again. You try to connect it once again. So uh, maintaining the ties meaning that if it's cut off, you give salam, you, ma you maintain cordial relationship. You don't necessarily have to be best friends with that person or th that family member, but you make sure that you are not in a state where you are boycotting, where one person is turning away from the other person. They see each other and they don't speak to each other. All right, that that, that is uh, what is prohibited. Hmm? Extent of family. So, uh, what is the extent of family? We mentioned earlier that this family was mentioned uh, men, um, meant here is anyone who shares ancestry with you. All right, lineage. Where where we your lineage with you, and uh, this can uh, obviously it can be expanded. All right, so it starts off with the immediate family, but then the more, the, the further they are away, the, the less emphasized it is. And the closer they are, the more emphasized it is. So the ones who share the same father, the same mother, obviously there are, they are a, a higher emphasis than, let's say, a distant cousin. But that distant cousin will still enter, but it will not be as emphasized as the brother or sister or the uncle or, or the aunt and so on. Right, that's general, right? So that hadith about cutting the ties, uh, of, of, uh, cutting ties, that's, that's not even for family, that's a Muslim in general, all right? So what about family as well, all right? The family is included in that even uh, more. All right, moving on. As-sabi'a wal khamsun min shu'a wal iman, husnul khuluq. Good uh, manners, good manners, good conduct. Of course, this is a very uh, long, lengthy topic. We're not gonna mention everything here, uh, but he mentions, uh, that included in good character is suppressing one's anger. Wal al All right, uh, those who restrain their anger and those who are forgiven uh, and pardoning, pardoning to the people. And um, specifically mentioned here is suppressing one's anger. Right, 
for a person to be described with good character is suppressing your anger. Because you can be a, a good a person of good character 99.9% .9 of the time, right? And that 1.1% 1 .1 of the time where you became angry and you had an outburst, that's all it takes for you to be described as a, uh, a person of bad character, right? You can, be, you can have all the good character 99% of the time. And that 1% that you became angry is all that's needed for people to say that this person has bad character. All right, so suppressing one's anger is very important for you to be described with uh, good anger, uh, but with good character. And we know that um, it all, all it takes is one burst of anger, right? one burst of anger, and your entire life can be ruined, right? A person gets extremely angry with their spouse or w whatever happens usually, and a person ends up uh, harming or even going to the extent of killing out of anger, and all the good that you did goes down the drain, right? And you get locked up for life, even if you were the best husband Right, for 30, 40, 50 years, and that one bout of anger, and you, you know, a person did something that they regret and they end up harming or even killing their spouse, and they go, you know, everything gets, goes down the drain. So suppressing one's anger is a very important part of good character. Uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa innaka la ala You are indeed upon great moral character. And this uh, verse has two uh, forms of emphasis. Wa innaka, the noon of tawkid and the lamb of tawqeed, wa innaka la ala, emphasizing the, uh, the character of the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it's, uh, in the hadith it mentions that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was never immoderate or obscene. He used to say, amongst, you, uh, 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 amongst those of you who are most beloved to me are those who have the finest character. And uh, from the characteristics of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is that uh, never was he given a choice between two things except that he chose the easier of them as long as it entailed no sin. And if it did entail sin, he was of all people the most remote from it. Never did he seek revenge for something done against himself. This is also a beautiful characteristic of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi that he would not take revenge for something done against himself. Meaning, he would not take things personally. He would not take things personally. When would Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi get angry? When the sanctity of Allah was challenged. This is when he would become angry and it would show in his face. He would get angry and his face would become red. When Allah's limits were crossed. But when it comes to personally being disrespected, he would never take revenge for himself, meaning he would never take things personally. This is also from character, that you don't take things personally. But when the, uh, when the sanctity of Allah was challenged, he would take vengeance for his sake alone. Um, <clears throat> Later he mentions um, some examples of not taking things personally. We're gonna read, uh, just uh, skip a few things and men mention some of the important things here. Uh, where he says here, uh, the author, that um, a person, right, this part here, where he falls ill. So this is a person who has been shown some type of disrespect. When he falls ill or returns from a trip and no one visits him. So this person, he, come out, he comes back from a trip or he's ill, he's sick, no one visits him. Or when he gives a greeting, and is not returned, or when he's a guest of somebody and he's not honored, or he intercedes and it's not responded to, or does a good turn for which he's not thanked, or joins a group of people who do not make room for him to sit, or he speaks and he's not listened to, or he asks permission of a friend to enter and he's not granted permission, or he proposes to a woman and he's not allowed to marry her, or he asks for more time to repay a debt and he's not given more time to repay that debt, or he asks for that debt to be reduced and is not permitted to be reduced. In all similar cases, a person, they are disrespected in some type of way. All right, what's the natural reaction? You take things personally, right? Somebody um, did not honor you as a guest. Somebody did not uh, listen to you as you were speaking. They didn't make room for you when you came. All right, these are all uh, situations where a person would react negatively and have ill feelings. And from good character is to not take these things personally. So this person, uh, he does not grow angry. He does not seek to punish people. He does not feel within himself that he's been subbed or ignored. He does not try to re retaliate or he does not give likewise treatment, right? So you don't go and do these things back even if somebody else has done that to you, right? You carry out your duties even if others do not carry out their duties towards you. And this is all part of a good character. 
And from good character, when we talk about uh, uh, containing your anger and not responding, this is when you have the ability to respond. This is where it is a, a true virtue. When you have the ability to take revenge, and you have the ability to respond, and you don't, then this is what's praiseworthy. As for a person, they don't have that ability. They're, they're too weak. And we don't say that that's, uh, that's part of good character, necessarily. It, it could be, but what is praiseworthy is when you have the opportunity to respond, to not forgive, to take out your anger, and you control yourself, then this is what is uh, praiseworthy. All right, uh, now when it comes to good character, there are uh, two types of good character, right? There is good character that a person is born with. All right, a person is born with, Allah created that person with these type of characteristics. And then there are good characteristics that are acquired, right? So everyone has certain characteristics that they were born with. Allah created you like that, right? Allah created a person gentle and soft-spoken and so on. And they have those characteristics by how Allah created them. And then there are certain characteristics that a person has that are developed and they have to train themselves and uh, uh, fight with themselves to acquire these characteristics. And there's a hadith on that in which uh, Rasulullah SAW came to one of the companions. He says that, inna fi, inna خَصْلَتَيْنْ يُحِبُّهُمَ اللَّهُ الْحِلْمُ وَالْأَنَا That uh, Rasulullah said to this companion, you have two characteristics that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. الْحِلْمُ وَالْأَنَا That uh, you have intelligence and you are a very gentle, a very gentle person. So the, so the Sahabi, he asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is, are these characteristics something that Allah has created me with? Or have they, uh, or is it something that I've acquired? And Rasulullah sallallahu said that this is something that you were created with. Allah created you with these characteristics. So this shows that certain characteristics are, you're created with them, and others, you have to acquire them. So how do you acquire good character? It mentions here next, afterwards, good character may be something which a man is born with or may be acquired. However, it may only be acquired from someone who has it more firmly rooted in his nature than his own. So if you want to acquire, uh, let's say, uh, intelligence, right, that's not, that can be acquired, then you need to associate with people who have higher intelligence than you. And that's how you acquire intelligence. All right? If you want to acquire, uh, acquire the trait of uh, controlling your anger, then you need to uh, be in the company of those who are able to control their anger. So if you are in the con company of people who have this characteristic, then you can develop it, right? You can develop it. And he says here, it is well known that a man of sensible opinion, a person of intellect, can become even more sensible, can even become more smarter and more intelligent by keeping company of intelligent and sensible people. And the, and the opposite is likewise true. If you hang out with foolish people, you're gonna become foolish with, like them. So if you wanna become intelligent, and this is something you can acquire, and, and, and likewise, any other good characteristic, then you associate with intelligent people, and you will eventually uh, acquire those characteristics. Uh, so by sitting and, and learning uh, with people of learning righteousness, if you want to acquire righteousness, then you sit and learn with people of righteousness. All right, moving on. الثامن والخمسون من شعب الإيمان الإحسان إلى المماليك الإحسان إلى المماليك kindness to bondsmen, which meant by bondsmen here are slaves, slaves. And this is a long, uh, long topic uh, with regards to the concept of slavery in Islam. And uh, just to summarize, Islam discouraged slavery, right? It discouraged slavery, but it did not ban it outright. It did not ban it outright, but it definitely discouraged it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made many different ways to, for a person to become free. So many, uh, many uh, punishments, uh, the expiation for that is freeing a slave. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, in general, good deeds, fakku raqaba, freeing a slave. But it was not explicitly uh, banned during the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Some of the scholars have said that it was eventually made to be uh, uh, prohibited or uh, outlawed, but it was not explicitly uh, banned during the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa It was still maintained, but it was, of course, reformed. And this uh, concept of slavery, uh, because this word, slavery, has a lot of... Um, it has historical trauma, right? A lot of historical trauma from what we know of Western uh, slavery and that institution. So this is why it's, it's a very sensitive topic to talk about because of what we know of how it, uh, you know, the institution was uh, practiced in uh, the Western world uh, when, uh, uh, hundreds of years ago, right? And until when it was outright banned. 
So definitely, uh, Islam does not encourage slavery, and it encourages to a person, person to be free. But it did not outright ban uh, slavery during the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we'll see this here in the next hadith, right? Where uh, first uh, he mentions the verse, worship Allah alone and associate nothing with him and to parents do good and the relatives and orphans, the needy, the near neighbor, the far neighbor, the companion at your side, the traveler and those whom your right hand possesses, meaning the, the slave. And then he mentions the hadith uh, of Abu Dharr who he was once seen with his bondsman, his slave. And both were wearing identical cloaks. And so the narrator says that I asked him, I asked Abu Dhar about this, and he replied, I once insulted a man, and he complained of me before Rasulullah who said to me, have you insulted him by his mother? You are a man in whom there is something of jahiliyyah. And then Rasulullah said, your bondsmen are your brethren, whom Allah has set in charge, in, in your charge. Whoever has his own brother in his charge must feed him uh, with the food he eats himself. So this is how Islam reformed that concept without banning it outright. Uh, so he must feed him with the food which he eats himself. And he must clothe him with the clothes that he wears himself. And he must not set him excessively hard tasks. And in the latter case, if you do give hard tasks, then you must help him in that. All right, so this hadith shows that Islam, uh, it reformed the relationship between the slave, uh, make, making sure that the slave is given the same food, given the same clothes, and given the rights that they are, uh, they are deserving of. But as we mentioned, it was not outright banned at that time, but it was reformed in a way to make it uh, not acceptable, but, but to make it, uh, to, to, to lessen the oppression that was present in the slavery. You, you had a question? Well, yeah. Um, it's pretty much that. I just mm. Right. <coughs> right. Yeah. So yeah, as I said, this word slavery has, right? It has historical trauma, which is why it's, uh, we, even using that term and comparing it to the, the concept that Islam reformed, it's uh, it's not a it's, it's not a it's not a word we can't do justice by using the same word. All right. That's maybe that's why he brings the term bondsman or or of that sort. Right. Um, so Islam reformed it, but because it was a necessary part of the society at that time, it was not outrightly banned. But once it, once it became no longer necessary, then Islam is not in need of it, right? So right now, slavery is officially banned, I think, in all, in all countries of the world. And there's no Islamic country, or there's no Islamic uh, uh, ruling that calls for its return, right? Calling for its return. Allahu Akbar. Um, I think we are, yes. Right. Right. Uh, so the, the brother's asking about how a person became a slave during those days versus in modern Western slavery. Uh, so, it, as you mentioned, right, uh, they would just go and pick somebody up and become a slave. In Islam, this was this is not allowed, right? This would uh, there are certain ways in which uh, a slave can be acquired, and it's one of those ways is not just going and grabbing people and putting them in a, in a boat, right? This is. This is not something uh, that Islam allows. Um, I think we uh, will have to um, pause here, inshallah, because we are uh, at the uh, adhan, time of the adhan. So um, we have a session, inshallah, we continue next week. We will try to uh, continue and finish uh, the book. We still have some weeks to go, but inshallah, we will try to uh, continue with the session next week. Uh, but we'll have to pause here for today uh, as the, uh, the time of the adhan is uh, coming. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليه صلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد والحمد لله رب العالمين.